The ancient Chinese had super ships that were way ahead of their time. Floating mega fortresses, 600 feet long, capable of carrying 2,000 troops. Catapults that flung red hot cannonballs. High tech underwater mines, capable of wrecking holes in any ship. Many believe the ancient Chinese naval engineers were so advanced that they built ships large and strong enough across the Pacific Ocean and discover America 71 years before Columbus. The Ancient Discoveries team is investigating Chinese super ships. In 2002, research was published that rocked the academic world and had the potential to rewrite the history of the United States. Traditional history, as taught, is just pure fantasy. Before long, the whole theory of how North America was populated will be stood on its head. The report's authors claimed that ancient Chinese ship technology was so advanced they were building ocean-going liners on a scale that we are matching today. People will say most of the native peoples of North America actually came by sea. The book claimed that a Chinese fleet led by Admiral Zheng He had crossed the ocean and discovered America 71 years before Columbus. If true, this claim would change U.S. history beyond recognition. It seems to me highly probable uh, that a Chinese junk got blown off coast uh, from China and with the North Pacific drift found itself somewhere on the west coast of America. Discovery means what you find, you communicate to others. And we have no evidence from the Chinese records at all that anybody ever came back saying, hey guys, I found this new place. In naval warfare, the ability to attack from a long range has always been crucial. Today's battle wagons have ship-to-ship -ship missiles to engage enemy vessels before they get too close. The closer warring ships are to each other, the more vulnerable they are to attack. It turns out the ancient Chinese understood this and had their own long-distance ballistics. There's evidence of catapults being used in China from very early date to 4th to the 3rd century BC. Um, there were already some in existence, and these were gradually developed into a whole range of weapons. The only thing that really made them obsolete was the use of gunpowder, which was coming in by the sort of 11th and 12th centuries. Richard Windley has built a model of this machine. What we have here today is uh, my reconstruction of a Chinese catapult. The particular one we've got here is called the Zhuang Feng or um, whirlwind catapult. There was a whole range of sizes of catapults. What we have today is really the little baby of, of the range. Um, this is about 12 feet high, but they went up to absolutely massive devices, and, and some of the records explain that there were between 80 and 100 men pulling some of these things, so massive projectiles could be fired. The catapult was a versatile projectile delivery system. They were quite prepared to throw um, human heads uh, uh, back at the enemy, and um, they threw explosive devices, incendiary devices. The effectiveness of this catapult lay in its lightweight design. They were traction, which meant that they were pulled by uh, men, and on the back end would be the projectile. The Chinese applied ingenious technology to natural resources. The arms of these things are made from bamboo, and um, they were made from varying numbers of bamboo rods. This would give them a kind of flex. The catapult had such an efficient power-to-weight ratio, it was light enough to be deployed on board ship. Weights could be shot at enemy ships, destroying wood, ropes, and sails. We're going to um, try and fire at a target which is moored out on the lake. This is meant to represent a sort of a, a section of a wooden hull. We're going to load the catapult with iron balls, and we're just going to test the range and, um, and hopefully get some idea of accuracy. The Chinese stopped using the catapult in the modern era. Richard and his team are about to fire this model for the very first time. OK, can you untie then? they will be performing exactly the same actions as the ancient Chinese marines did 1,500 years ago. 
Okay. All clear. Three, two, one. Ball. Oh. That was fantastic. Um, we missed, we, well, I think we did just catch the very front end of the target, but um, if the guys can pull just a tiny bit harder, then we should be just about right. But uh, we're going to give it another go and see how we get on. OK. Right, all clear. Three, two, one, pull. Whoa. Oh, shot! We finally hit it, so that's quite good going. Um, obviously, the different projectiles are going to need different ranges, are going to need different amounts of pull. So the whole thing is, is, is hugely complex, but the fact that we can hit it, I think, is testament to the design of the machine. The Chinese weren't just launching cannonballs. There are little-known references to something even more insidious. Ancient texts speak of the ability to launch molten fireballs. Where Westerners in the 18th century are superheating their round shot for the damage it will do to a wooden deck. The Chinese are doing the same thing. They're superheating metal projectiles. In an ancient forge, historian and blacksmith Hector Cole is investigating the evidence. I think it, the possibility of them firing hot projectiles, yes, you can. You'd need a pretty advanced technology to get the metal molten and get it quickly onto your throwing device before it solidifies. So you're not going to have molten metal flying through the air, you're going to have solidified metal flying through the air. Hector has built a career reconstructing ancient weapons using only ancient forging techniques. The first challenge is to get the balls hot enough. Now to get hot a large piece of metal like that, you need a very large fire and a lot of air being blown into it. And early man was then using bellows of some sort, which then delivered the air into the fire. And with that technology, the Chinese were melting iron. And once you've got iron into a molten state, you can then pour it into whatever shape you like. Now, that didn't occur in Western Europe until hundreds of years later. The furnace raises the temperature of the iron cannonball to 1,500 degrees. Forges work by focusing the heat in. They do not give out much heat. This means they are safe to be installed on wooden boats. The Chinese would have installed smaller versions of exactly this type of forge on board ship. The effectiveness of burning hot metal is extraordinary. If you have hot metal, and it lands on something, and it is hot enough, and that thing is combustible, then it will burst into flame. Now, it doesn't take much realization to think that if you could lob one of these, red hot, as hot as you can get it, onto a ship, the people on board ship are going to panic because the last thing that you want on a ship is uncontrolled fire. Hector leaves the cannonball in the 1500 degree forge for 15 minutes. The metal heats to red hot. Well, we now have a red hot cannonball. It's taken about 15 minutes to get up to this heat. So the thing to do is to see what it will do if it landed on anything that's combustible. Hector's first test is to investigate what the ball would do to card or paper, such as might be found in sails or packing on board ship. And that was instantaneous. If you were on board ship, quite frightening. Highly effective. But how will the hot ball affect the planking of the ship itself? Hector places a two inch thick piece of wood into the forge, exactly the type used on an ancient Chinese ship. That's just as impressive. It's on fire, the fire's spreading out. Panic. No one's going to pick that up. A thundered ship. But how will the red-hot ball shoot in Richard's catapult? Blacksmith Adrian May has supplied a mobile lightweight forge of the size and power that could have been used on an ancient ship. 
We've got a blacksmith here today who's had the forge going for some time now. Uh, there's some cannonballs heating up in the forge. Um, they've been in there for about half an hour, I believe, and um, they should be getting up to medium orange heat now. What we're going to do is to load them into the catapult and see if we can actually hit this target. All clear. Three, two, one, pull. The ball is still hot as it flies through the air. The only part of a process the ancient marines would have had to perfect was their aim. But some ships were simply too big to destroy. The Chinese built some of the largest and strangest looking ships in the entire ancient world. China is a gigantic nation. It covers 3,700,000 square miles. And most of this country is covered in rivers. From an early date, naval warfare in China developed in a different direction from the way it had in the West. There were very few overseas opponents who needed to be reached by a, what we would call a blue water navy. The main waterways on which Chinese navies operated were the great rivers. To police and control these waterways of some 20,000 miles, the ancient Chinese developed a full fleet of technologically advanced river ships. Already by the time of the Han Dynasty, there were multiple hulled warships floating on China's rivers. And in 285 AD, the ultimate example of this was created for the campaign against the Kingdom of Wu. They developed one of the largest battle cruisers of the ancient world. The ship was designed as a moving castle. Rather than march an army into hostile territory and have to build a fortress under fire, or in the absence of natural timber. All they had to do was bring this ship down the river. They then had a stronghold in enemy territory from which to launch attacks. It was said to have been 600 feet on each side. This enormous warship was built on the upper Yangtze River and was floated down to the Kingdom of Wu to act as a sort of floating fortress. Chinese ship design adapted the technologies and devices they already had and created ancient floating death stars. The issue is primarily about soldiers coming to a patch of water and realizing they're not going to be able to get anywhere with their military campaign unless they get afloat. There is no record of whether these ships were a military success, but the shock and awe value of seeing one coming to your country would have gone a long way to winning the psychological battle for the development of floating mobile fortresses became intrinsic to Chinese riverine war tactics. Throughout Chinese naval warfare history, you get these references to what are called Luochuan or tower ships. What you would have built as a standard child's castle, if you like, uh, on the land to attack or defend, they built one of those and set it afloat. And therefore you got these tower ships, which were literally floating forts. In 584 AD, the emperor commissioned the military genius Yang Su to build a tower ship five stories high and equipped with what we think was an entirely new weapon for the time, a striking arm. In Chinese river combat, opposing tower ships basically bashed each other's brains out. The Luchuan were designed literally to come alongside each other. There was no long distance artillery. You couldn't stand off and bombard the guy next door. The whole object of it was like galley warfare. You lay alongside, and at that point, you did the maximum damage to the opposition that you could in the shortest possible time. Uh, you did it, first of all, with your close quarters weapons, like huge arms with big weights on the end. You smashed into their deck to open them up, and then with the grapples pulling them hard alongside, you then rush your soldiery across into there, and then testosterone-filled males would bash each other to bits. To defend their sailors against attack, the ancient Chinese shipbuilders created a new type of design. By 418 AD, we start to hear of paddle wheel warships. First of all, the people operating the paddles were entirely enclosed within the hull and protected from missiles. Another advantage was that they were more manoeuvrable than ships propelled by sails or oars because they could be steered simply by stopping the wheels on one side. 
And this entirely new invention terrorized its opponents because it seemed to move without any visible means of propulsion, as if, as they said at the time, it was propelled by spirits. Seeing the success of the paddle ships in action, the Chinese continued to develop and enhance the design. The first paddle wheel ships were propelled by a single wheel on either side, but as time went on, they got larger and larger, and the number of wheels increased up to as many as 23 or even 32. 1,400 years after their invention, these paddle wheel ships were still being used by the Chinese in the opium wars against the British in the 1840s. As in all ship innovation in China, inspiration came from dry land. That the Chinese invented paddle wheels is actually fascinating because it means that somebody did a brilliant piece of lateral thinking. They would have looked at, for example, the standard Chinese system of watering a field where a river flows past a paddle wheel and makes it raise water into a field. And somebody have worked out, oh, well, gosh, if we did that the other way around where we rotated the paddle wheel, we would make the river go along. And they put it on the side of a ship and they worked out how to propel it by getting men to run on treadles. Innovation pushed the boundaries of technology to the limit. This is a Song Dynasty warship. It uh, was obviously designed to mine or torpedo an enemy ship. At the front here, you can see nails, and the ship is propelled as fast as four oarsmen can push it into the side of another wooden vessel. The nails smack in, making the front of the boat immovable, and then they lit all these fuses and promptly retired by pulling the pins out in the middle of the boat and went that way and they hope they can paddle this away fast enough before this goes bang. Absolutely no comparison at all between this and any modern ship. I've never seen anything like it. The massive array of options and choices of attack vessel made fleets a force to be reckoned with. To counter this threat, ancient engineers were forced to develop anti-shipping countermeasures. John Bevan is an expert in the history of submarine technology. Mines in the Western world first appeared around the mid-1800s, and particularly during the Crimean War, uh, and around the Black Sea and even the Baltic, uh, where the Allies, the British and the French were uh, fighting the Russians, and the Russians had produced mines at that time, and they were successfully uh, damaging our ships. Uh, they were con there were two types they had. They had contact mines, uh, and they had mines that they could detonate from the shore using uh, electrical wires, which were quite uh, state-of-the-art uh, technology at the time. Uh, so uh, again, you know, the, it's taken the West, uh, the Western world, a thousand years to catch up with what the Chinese have been doing. Mine technology in ancient China was generations ahead of its time. The ancient discoveries team has traveled to a test tank in Britain to investigate ancient Chinese mine technology. So what I've got in front of me is uh, a small reconstruction of uh, an ancient Chinese device. This was from the 14th century fire drake manual, and this was a manual of all kinds of military hardware of the period. Now, obviously, um, in China during periods of warfare, which were pretty frequent, the rivers were a fairly major communications network, and anyone that could control the rivers had got strategic advantage. And this device really was used for that purpose, to actually protect and defend. Basically, what we're looking at is a device which used gunpowder bombs. Um, we've only got one on here, but some of the diagrams in the fire drake manual show whole collections of bombs. And these are all fused together. And the fuse is carried through this um, rather disgusting looking material here, which is actually pig's intestine. And the idea of this is that it's waterproof and it would help protect the fuse from getting wet and um, so allow it to burn. The board which they're strapped to was suspended in the water by using floats, which are these things here. Now, the originals would have been bladders, either from oxen or from large animals. These provide the flotation, and the whole device is anchored with stones to the bottom of the river. There's several different ways of igniting them. Um, one which is described is this device here, which is just a little floating pot. And suspended in this um, is a wooden plug. There's an incense stick here, which is attached to the fuse. So the incense stick will obviously slowly burn down. And then when it gets to the bottom, uh, there's a little bit of gun cotton on here, which ignites the fuse. The length of time from ignition to explosion could be varied by the length of the fuse, from a couple of seconds to many minutes. The fuse then burns down through the waterproofing uh, intestine here until it reaches the bomb, which obviously then explodes underwater. 
what we're hoping to do now is to set this thing up in the tank. We've got a small charge in here because we can't use anything too large um, for safety reasons. And hopefully we're going to set, uh, set the fuse alight and um, see if it will go off. The first challenge is to achieve a balance between the floating devices and the anchors so that the mine hangs at exactly the correct depth. But the most important part of the trial is to test whether the divers can set and arm the mine underwater without getting the key parts wet. In the days before electricity, the gunpowder-based fuse had to be kept completely dry. Well, that was really interesting, bearing in mind that there was one charge which was less than an ounce of powder. The Chinese um, devices would probably have had at least three, four, five pounds of powder. If we, if we multiply that little, little pop that we just had by perhaps a hundred times, we can get some idea of the possible damage that these things were capable of achieving. It certainly looks as though this is going to be a really quite a, an awesome weapon. Anybody trying to navigate a river, one or two of these things going off, they don't know how many more there are, they don't know how widespread they are, they don't know how long they go for. Um, as a deterrent, it's, it's a superb device. I'm absolutely amazed at it because it took us a thousand years to catch up with the Chinese. The ancient Chinese mine was an advanced technology way ahead of its time. As in all military innovations, it was not dreamt up for fun, but a necessary development to meet a definite threat. And this threat came from the Chinese shipbuilders. For the boatyards of China were centuries ahead of the rest of the world. They created ships whose design and technology is still used today. The world's longest lasting ship design, and the Chinese built millions of them. The ship is called the junk. The longest lasting ship design in history is the ancient Chinese junk. In hull construction, for example, China is not terribly well endowed with high quality shipbuilding timber. So the Chinese came up with a very simple answer. As opposed to using thousands of trees in order to build a hull, they created an internal division system in order to create a shape of a hull with a minimum use of timber. So you create an extremely light, extremely strong hull using very few trees. It's brilliant. The craft was flat bottomed. The flat hull gave a lot of advantages operating in estuaries and rivers. The junk had to be capable of operating down the harbor and also going right upstream. And the junks had to go through rapids and also to be very strong. Uh, to withstand the odd blows from the odd rocks as it went up. The flat hull also improved the performance of the rudder. Because of the shape of Chinese boats, basically they have flat ends and flat fronts, they were able to use a steering oar that went straight over the middle of the back. Water's got to flow cleanly onto a rudder blade for it to be able to steer you. If you've got the bottom of a hull like that and you lower an oar, it comes right out below the bottom of the hull into clean water. And that's what the Chinese did. They gradually lowered the oar until it was sticking right out of the bottom of the hull, and then it steered brilliantly. The rudder itself was a highly advanced piece of technology. The advantage of the rudder over a stern oar was that they required less physical operation. We think that they were using them for probably over a thousand odd years before the Europeans started them, and the Chinese rudders were also capable of being lifted up or down. So if the vessel took ground, they could lift the rudder up. Whereas invariably, when a European ship touched, it smashed the rudder, and now the ship was pretty hopeless. Western ships had a fixed rudder which could not be raised in shallow water. They also used a skeletal system of design. A rib cage was built and planks nailed around it. 
but the Chinese were the first to develop and capitalize on bulkhead technology. Bulkheads divide the inner hull into sections, so if a hole is made in one part of a ship, only that part will flood. Bulkheads were introduced by the Chinese, we think, in the first century. It enabled it did two things, really, to a junk. It stiffened the hull of the junk frame up, so it stopped the, the torsional twisting. And it also, if you had water permeating into the department, or rock, or so forth, or even shell fire, um, it meant that water was held in that hold. The ancient Chinese derived their inspiration from nature. The Chinese were building rafts with bamboo, and the bulkheads built into bamboo naturally by nature uh, were thought, well, that's a wonderful idea, we'll incorporate it into our junks. The motor of a sailing boat is the sail. Marine engineer Cedric Bell has made a replica of an ancient Chinese junk sail. This is a model of a junk sail. The sails were held on a guard, battens down the sail, fixed to the sail, and then each batten was attached to the mast by a loose connection with rollers in to make it run freely. There were no stays on the mast, so constantly the, the sail could rotate all the way long. And attached to each of the battens were ropes which were called sheets. And each one was able to control from the deck the direction of the sail so it could do that or that. So these sheets then would control where the sail was in relation to the wind. The edges of the sail were so designed to give a form of lift, rather like aerofoil of an aeroplane or a bird's wing. The ability to completely rotate the sail allowed the Chinese junk to actually sail into the wind like a modern yacht. If you wished to reduce the sail, well, obviously, each batten went on top of the next and closed up like a Venetian blind. And then they were just tied together at the ends. But to lift the sail, which could weigh up to 10 tons, extra help was required. So we think they are provided with a balance weight, so the semi-automated. So you've got a counterbalance. Whatever position you got into, the counterbalance there held the sail in its position. The only problem is then, of course, if you've got a 90-foot mast and a 30-foot hull, then you've got to have a set of balls or else a ratio of here. So the ball drops one foot and the sail rests three. And the ball would run in guide so it wouldn't swing round. And when the ship was normally sailing, the weight would be on the hull as low as possible. So to raise the sail, minimum force would be required on the winch. Obviously, when the sails got wet, a little bit more effort was required. But conversely, when the sail was retracted to its lowest level, less power was required. The junk, the technological king of ancient shipbuilding, was the most successful ship design in history. The design could be applied to junks of all sizes, from smaller river craft to massive ocean-going liners. In 1421, a fleet of these massive ocean-going junks was built, called the Treasure Fleet. Some of the boats in the fleet were the size of a football field. Ancient Chinese mariners used them to complete huge voyages. Some people believe that they actually crossed the Pacific in junks like this one and discovered America. The theory is made even more amazing because some believe the ancient Chinese made their voyage of discovery 71 years before Columbus. In 2002, this man, Gavin Menzies, developed a theory that became a best-selling book. The book and the theory is called 1421. The ideas proposed in this book have caused controversy around the world. Any researchers who wanted to verify what 1421 is all about would have to find an unequivocally Chinese-built hull. Gavin claims to have decoded ancient Chinese texts and maps and discovered new evidence in China and around the world that proves that the ancient Chinese were the first to discover America, 71 years before Columbus made his historic voyage. The Chinese had a very long history of seafaring, which we've only just recently discovered. And one can say the DNA of the indigenous people of North America does not in any way reflect the Bering Straits 
theory about how, how America was populated. Gavin believes that on the 8th of March, 1421, a huge armada known as the Treasure Fleet left China under the command of Admiral Zheng Ha. Its mission was to explore the entire world and bring back treasure both in the form of gold and jewels as well as in knowledge to the emperor. The fleet was massive. Literally thousands of ships set off. Some of these fleets got lost, got wrecked, landed up in America or wherever, and never came home. If the fleet, or part of it, landed in America, this would have massive implications for the history of the nation. Traditional history, as taught, is just pure fantasy. Before long, the whole theory of how North America was populated will be stood on its head. The trail begins in China. China's maritime past is one of the most glorious chapters because it's unique. It approached all kinds of problems in its own way, unrelated to anybody else's, usually much earlier than anybody else. The first question is whether the Chinese could have built boats big enough to complete the voyage. To help solve the mystery, a replica of the Zheng He treasure ship has been constructed. Experts have different views on the subject. But we believe that the original treasure ships commanded by Zheng He were up to 450 feet long, judging by excavated items. In Nanjing, there is evidence of an even bigger boat. We found three huge rudders at the dry dock on the same site. This shows the scale of the ships built there. It also shows that three ships were maintained there at the same time. Gavin Menzies believes that these boats had the potential to reach America. Here, the search is on for the hard evidence. A lot of marine engineers have, I think, quite reasonably argued these ships are so enormous, I mean, they're bigger than a football pitch, that they just couldn't have survived in a sea, they would have uh, broken up. Cedric Bell, who's a distinguished marine engineer, has found that the hulls were stiffened by pouring in concrete so they prevented hogging and sagging by pouring in man-made concrete right at the base of the hull all the way along the ship. So that stiffened them both laterally and longitudinally. This is a piece of the concrete which I took out of the Chinese treasure ship at Meraki. The concrete, which was made from volcanic dust, was cast into the hull. Firstly, the hull was, was coated with rice adhesive. This might sound strange that using rice, but the Great Wall of China used rice mortar, which is strong and durable. And the purpose of the uh, adhesive was to make sure there was an intimate bond between the concrete and the hull, prevent water being held there and corrosion. On this actual piece, this side was against the hull, and you can actually see traces of the grains of the rice adhesive. There are many in the academic community who believe Gavin and his supporters have got it completely wrong. Professor Stephen Davis agrees that the Chinese were the first people in America, but not that they discovered it. Discovery is a tricky thing. Obviously, the Chinese ancestors discovered America because they walked there. Um, almost every Native American comes from the same basic peoples who populated the eastern part of the Eurasian continent. So in one sense, yeah, they discovered America. Then we come to the whole concept of discovery. Discovery means what you find, you communicate to others. And we have no evidence from the Chinese records at all that anybody ever came back saying, hey guys, I found this new place. Hard evidence is needed to solve this debate. Oh gosh, I mean, if they find a junk, wherever it's supposed that Zheng He went, and they can carbon date it accurately in an attested laboratory, the independence, etc., of which is unimpeachable, wow. Over 6,000 miles away on the Oregon coast, the 1421 team believes they have found this evidence. 
Today, a team led by Dave Kotner will drill into the dunes near Newport, Oregon. They believe they have discovered the boat here and are about to silence the world's critics. If they find what they're looking for, they will turn American history on its head. On the North Oregon coast, Dave Kotner believes he has discovered evidence that the ancient Chinese discovered America decades before Columbus made his famous voyage. The North Oregon coast has been subjected to massive tidal waves, called tsunamis, for centuries. In 1421, a huge tidal wave hit these beaches. Astronomers tell us that back about that time, a giant meteorite struck the Earth just south of New Zealand and blew a 25-kilometer hole in the ocean floor and created a 700-foot, if you can imagine, tsunami. And then by the time it got here, they claim it was about 40 feet tall and moving at 350 miles an hour. And some of the ships that I found up here are 140 feet above sea level. So you can imagine the force it took to shove these things up here. Dave uses a technique known as divining to search for gas, oil, gold, silver, and treasure. His hit rate is immaculate. He has discovered mines that have produced millions of dollars of gold and silver all across the southwest of the United States. But now he believes he has discovered the greatest prize of all, the actual Chinese junks that brought the first non-Native Americans to America, the Chinese, 71 years before Columbus. Dave is marking out the buried ship using his divining technique. There's four two by two foot by two foot pieces down on the bottom of this ship. Dave feels the vibrations of the rods through his hands. Your subconscious mind talking to your conscious mind. And this is a way it uses to transmit the messages. And as I walk along, if my subconscious mind thinks that make a turn, the rods will turn. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna dig, the water level right here is six foot below the sand. We're gonna dig down to the water level, drop a pump into it, and use that to help us put a casing down into it till we hit the wood. Dave calls in his digging and construction crew. Y'all think you might need some help? <laughs> Maybe. Could this be the legendary treasure ship of Zheng Ha? The ship that Gavin Menzies believes brought the original Chinese explorers to Oregon and discovered America? The team begins drilling in high spirits. They bore a hole using plastic piping. They insert a hose into the hole, which flushes out the sand. Once the hole is complete, the team can insert the drill and remove the wood. It's kind of like a saw. It just saws its way into the thing. And it's got carbide tips, and carbide is tougher than anything we'll ever get there. You can look through it just like looking down a gun barrel. Is Dave getting closer to the boat that discovered America? If you wanted to prove that a Chinese vessel got to America, you would look down the coast, the west coast of America, the most likely place they would have come, come ashore, and you would be seeing if you could find a Chinese junk hull. Of course, one problem you've got to face is that there's quite a lot of junk hulls down that coast, which all arrived in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, there was quite a flow of people, basically economic migrants. So you'd have to be able to be quite sure that what you were finding was a 15th century junk and not a 19th century one. Even the weather seems against Dave. We've hit a new level. We've been going down through different stages of the sand. Then the wind comes and the rain comes. And we've gone through so many different levels. We've gone through sticks. We've gone through leaves and debris. And you can see it. It's obvious when we wash it up. Now we've got blue sand. I have no idea what it is, but it's totally different than what we have in our surroundings. So we're hoping that's a good sign. But the team perseveres. We're getting closer. By the second day, the storm front has passed and Dave can resume his work. His plan, to drill 40 feet into the sand and into the wood along the keel of the ship he will remove a core sample. 
If he is successful, the sample will be sent to the lab for carbon dating. We're there now. We're just knocking on the door. We got to be within six inches of it. Dave believes that if his sample can be shown to come from 1421, it will prove that the Chinese discovered America. This happened 71 years before Columbus, and uh, it's going to change a lot of thinking. There is excitement in the camp. The country up here has an air of ancient mystery. Will Dave finally uncover the riddles that have laid hidden beneath the sands for centuries? Or will Professor Stephen Davis be right? All of the ocean current circulation systems that operated in the 15th century would have to have been quite different to the ones that operate today. Actually, they had to work backwards. And I don't think they did. My suspicion is, if huge Chinese ships weren't built, they were a large and flashy platform on which the emperor stood in 1405 when Zheng He set to sea to wave goodbye with his retinue. Uh, and they stayed put. And Zheng He, like any sensible seaman, went to sea in a ship that could actually move. After 40 feet and six hours, they finally hit something. We got wood got coming wood. out of the hole. Got wood. <laughs> Look at here. Keel pieces. That's it. That's Chinese wood right there. That's the stuff dreams are made out of. That's better than gold. 22 years I've been trying for this. Wood from an ancient Chinese junk? Unfortunately, the wood chips are too small a sample to carbon date accurately. The lab will need about 50 grams. Dave believes he understands why his sample is so small. I'm reasonably sure we're, we're drilling into a two-foot section. It was like a keel piece. It goes down to two feet in a solid piece of wood. Well, I think we're drilling into the top of it. I think what happened is the drill bit got into it, and he couldn't pull it out. So I reversed the drill a little too much, and it come out pulling the sand and left the wood. The team sinks another hole. After another six hours, the team is bewildered. It's, it's a mystery to us why we're not, whether we're off in our depth, and we're not sure if we're off in our, our width. There's three of us that doused it, and we all come up with the same width, and we've all come up with approximately the same depth, but we don't know why we're missing this, because we picked up the water table, and we're within a few inches. Now, it's not making sense. Well, I don't have any idea why we are not coming up with the core. Normally, we're right on. I just don't understand it. I don't know why. The only thing I can think of is some kind of an atmospheric condition that's messing us up. I know it makes a difference when the sun is shining than it does when the sun isn't shining. The sands of Oregon do not give up her secrets to all searchers. The mystery of the Chinese junk still lies buried under the dunes. As the winter finally closes in on the shoreline, Dave and his team must pack up vowing to return in the next digging season and uncover the boat. We will get it, no question about it, but we're not going to get it today. As the crew departs this desolate place, all that remains shrouding the secrets of the ancient Chinese treasure ships is sand, fog, and mystery. 20 years from now, we will have a completely different idea who discovered the world, how it was discovered, how the Americas were populated, and how the Renaissance and our current modern way of life was based to a very large extent on Chinese intellectual uh, know-how. Never ever stop looking. I mean, the whole point about historical research is that it's a falsification system. Uh, you have a hypothesis. You then strenuously attempt to show that it's wrong. All you've got to find is one piece of evidence that shows that you're wrong and the hypothesis is blown away. Whatever side academics take in the 1421 argument, they all agree on one thing. We know that they solved all the problems of getting afloat in a unique way, usually much earlier than anybody else. How you build a hull, how you steer it, and how you propel it. All of the Chinese answers are fascinating and unique, and we know far, far too little about it. The super ships of the ancient Chinese navies were technological achievements out of their time. From red-hot projectile delivery systems to hull design, the Chinese were building the most advanced ships of antiquity. 
Whether they used them to actually discover America remains a mystery that many believe is ridiculous, but some are still trying to prove.